And so we are here today to talk about state-to-state -state investment treaty arbitration, uh, whether it's a dead end or perhaps a new frontier, we don't know yet. Um, and I'm just going to start off by, by setting the scene a little bit, which is I think that when we talk about investment treaty arbitration, we often talk about sort of two different worlds. Um, there's the old world, and in the old world, you have the four investment treaties. You had customary international law, and you also had uh, friendship, commerce, and navigation <coughs> treaties. And under these, there was no such thing as investor state arbitration. There were substantive rights and protections of investors, but any dispute resolution was done on a state-to-state -state level. And most of these included clauses that allowed the states to bring claims about the interpretation or application of the relevant treaty. So at that level, we've got a diplomatic protection model and a state-to-state -state model. Fast forward to the investment treaty generation, and what we started to have investment treaties originally is exactly the same state-to-state -state arbitration model. But then in some of the newer investment treaties, and now overwhelmingly investment treaties, we have the state-to-state -state arbitration model, but now the real focus is on investor-state arbitration, and that's considered to be the real innovation of the modern investment treaty system. But I think that the focus that we've had on the investor-state arbitration is perhaps a little bit misleading, and that's because you tend to think of the old world as involving state-to-state -state claims, the new world as involving investor-state claims, but of course, almost all of these treaties actually include both provisions in them. They include, include a state-to-state -state arbitration track about interpretation or application of the treaty, and also an investor-state arbitration track about investment disputes. And so one of the questions that arises is kind of what, what content should we give to these two different provisions? And how should they react with one another? And you might think, well, what does it matter? We've had hundreds of investor state arbitration cases, but is state to state arbitration something that's likely to happen? And the answer is that at least recently, we've seen at least three different cases where state to state arbitration has happened. So to give you a, a brief summary of the three, the first was in the Luchetti versus Peru case. Uh, we had a company from Chile with a dispute against Peru. And Peru thought that for various reasons the dispute fell outside the jurisdiction of the bit, fell outside the bit. And Peru tried to get an interpretive agreement, I understand, from Chile, and failing in getting an interpretive agreement, launched an arbitration, Peru against Chile, to try and get an, an interpretation of that investment treaty. And it actually asked the investor state arbitral tribunal to stay deliberations pending a decision from this state to state tribunal. Now, in that case, the investor state tribunal did not stay, and it went ahead, and Peru did not continue with this state to state arbitration. But at least it starts to raise a question mark about what role state to state arbitration might play in terms of its application. The second case that this has come up in is the Italy and Cuba case. So in Italy, we had um, Italy representing or bringing a diplomatic protection claim on behalf of about a dozen of its investors against Cuba. And so we have there the coexistence of a diplomatic protection claim even though you have a modern investment treaty. And we're going to have some discussion here about how broad or narrow the Italy-Cuba precedent might be. And the final case, which is the one that's the most controversial and, and the most recent, is Ecuador against the United States. And that's because um, Ecuador had actually been sued by Chevron under an, investment, uh, under an investment treaty. And Ecuador received the award against it in that case and was particularly unhappy with uh, some of the uh, interpretations given by the tribunal. And while that award was still under the set aside proceedings at the seat of arbitration, Ecuador brought a case against the United States. In fact, Ecuador sent a diplomatic note to the United States saying, we think the interpretation by the tribunal is wrong. Can you let us know your agreement? Or if you don't say anything or if you disagree, we'll take that to be a disagreement and we'll bring potentially a case against you, which is what they did. And we don't yet have any, any award out on the Ecuador versus US case. But we do know that the tribunal did not find jurisdiction in that case, found that there was not a dispute about the interpretation or application of the treaty. Uh, thanks to International Arbitration Reporter, we know that much. And um, so we do have a sense that there are these new cases that have happened and might be on the horizon that really start to uh, make, make us pose the question, given that we have the existence of investor-state arbitration, what content, if any, should we give state-to-state -state arbitration? 
and potentially vice versa, given that we have state-to-state -state arbitration, what content is it giving investor-state arbitration? What is the content of these two different uh, forms of arbitration? And how are they going to interact? Um, particularly over disputes about interpretation, which is likely to be the real case. The, you can hear all the rustling, I'm afraid of yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Diplomatic protection claims like the Italy Cuba case, and also a, a category I'm going to talk about, declaratory claims. So we've put together a panel today with people who have um, a lot of the first-hand knowledge of this. Uh, so we have uh, one of our lawyers for the US government in the US Ecuador case, one of our lawyers for, the ex for, for Ecuador, one of our experts for the uh, US government. We also have one of the only people who's written on the Italy-Cuba case, and we also have just general specialists about the idea of state-to-state -state arbitration. I'm not planning to run this as set speeches. I want this to be interactive, so I'm going to be posing questions to panelists and, and having a discussion back and forth. But I also invite any members of the audience to ask questions throughout. Just signal to me, and I'll try and keep you in queue to ask questions. Because this is, this is a novel issue, this is a controversial issue, and it's something that could be a real problem for the investment treaty system, but it could also be a reformulation of the investment treaty system. So I want to start with the, the most controversial uh, case, the recent case, Ecuador, US. And I want to first turn to Andrew, because Andrew was one of the lawyers for Ecuador. And Andrew, I want you to tell us, what, what is it that you were trying to achieve with this state to say, Okay, so what was it that you were after, and why did you think it was a legitimate claim to bring? Sure, well, well thank you very much. And, and before I directly answer the question, I just want to thank Anthony for, for organizing this really interesting panel, um, which deals with issues that, as you mentioned, are, are really new kind of edge, and I think are, are worthy of, of real academic study and debate. So I really want to commend her and Columbia's whole for, for hosting this event. I also want to make clear that although I was a advocate on behalf of Ecuador uh, in the recent interstate arbitration with the United States. Today I'm here in my personal capacity, and so the standard of caveat applies. Nothing I say should be attributed to the public of Ecuador, speaking solely in my own capacity. What Ecuador tried to achieve um, in launching the arbitration against the United States <coughs> relates to what Ecuador perceived as the need for achieving clarity in its obligations under is bilateral investment treaty with the United States. As Anthony mentioned, the, the history of, of the dispute derives from the fact that Ecuador was involved in an arbitration against Chevron brought under the bid between Ecuador and the United States. The main focus of the argument in the bid case between Ecuador and Chevron was whether Ecuador had reached its obligations not to commit to now justice with respect to a number of commercial um, cases that have been brought before the Ecuadorian courts. The argument being that undue delay by the Ecuadorian courts had caused a denial of justice. When the award in the case was rendered, the tribunal did not find that Ecuador had committed a denial of justice under customary international law. Instead, it made a finding that Ecuador had breached a separate provision of the bid concerning the effective means of access to Ecuadorian courts. More specifically, the, the tribunal held that this provision of the bid established obligations that went beyond customary international law and, in fact, represented a lex specialis. Now, when the award was rendered, this became a, became as, as a great surprise to Ecuador. Ecuador had always understood this particular provision of the bid as being coterminous with customary international law. And so it faced a quandary what to do. The tribunal had now ruled that and interpreted a provision of the bid at variance with the way Ecuador had understood the bid, at variance with the way that Ecuador had believed was a mutual understanding with the United States when the two countries concluded the bid. Now Ecuador understood that nothing it could do would alter the final and binding nature of the award in the investor state arbitration. But it faced an important question, you know, what to do about the fact that there was now an arbit arbitral award that interpreted the bid in a way that was contrary to its understanding of what that bid imposed. It was also contrary to the interpretation given to the same clause by another arbitral tribunal that also interpreted the same clause in an arbitration involving Ecuador. 
So Ecuador generally faced confusion as to what his obligations were, and understood his obligations were one thing, the arbitral tribunal held there were none. So Ecuador turned to what it thought was the natural place to obtain clarity. It turned to the other treaty partner to the bid, the United States. And it asked the United States whether the United States agreed with Ecuador's interpretation. And much to the uh, Ecuador's surprise, the United States didn't respond. And in fact said it would not respond. And so Ecuador determined that in these circumstances, there was a dispute, not just with respect to the, inter with, with the tribunal in the underlying arbitration, but actually an independent dispute with the United States. And Ecuador therefore decided to invoke its its authority and its ability under the bid to initiate a separate arbitration with the United States. And I'd like to just say a few words more generally about the role of state to state arbitration, both under this particular bid, but, but also as, as a general matter. Um, the Ecuador US bid, like, like a great many of this, includes, includes a clause that provides for states to initiate arbitral proceedings to resolve disputes regarding the interpretation or application of the bid. Now, this is a clause that is actually very familiar in international treaty making. Very similar language appears in a great, great, great many number of, of treaties, as disparate as the Torture Convention, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the Genocide Convention. There's some differences, but as a general matter, almost all, all these treaties provide for the ability of a state to resolve disputes over the interpretation or application of that particular treaty. And in fact, similar clauses appear in FCN treaties, uh, which have, as I'm sure many people here know, are the precursors to the modern bid system. So in Ecuador's view, the sort of plain meaning, plain understanding of, of the estate to the arbitration clause enabled it to bring it to claim against the United States, assuming that there was a dispute with the United States, to resolve the dispute in relation to the interpretation of the bid. So, just to sort of say a few words about the, about the wider context and of, of, of where the interstate dispute resolution clause um, fits within the, the wider context of, of dispute resolution under the bid. I think there's an important difference between the interstate arbitration clause and the state-to-state -state arbitration clause. And the two provide important, both overlapping but sometimes distinct functions that are both important to the well-functioning of the system. The investor state arbitration process, I would submit, is, is inherently retrospective. It concerns arbitration to adjudicate disputes that have arisen with respect to concrete actions that have taken place in which one party perceives that it, its rights under the bid under the have been breached. It's an inherently retrospective um, function. That's a much narrower grant of, of, of jurisdiction than the state to state clause, which as I said before, grants disputes for the grants of tribunal authority, not just to resolve disputes over application, i.e. disputes involving breach, but also disputes involving interpretation. That interpretation grant of jurisdiction suggests that an interstate arbitration you know, we have authority to interpret the clause prospectively. In other words, it doesn't rely upon an allegation of breach. That's how we don't want you to understand the disjunctive of uh, phraseology of the dispute resolution, this group resolution clause, interpretation or application. Now, I've seen that this, this performs a very important function in the bid system as, as a whole. First and most importantly, but importantly, it can help to clarify the obligations of the parties. As an initial matter, these are obligations that are owed between and among the treaty partners to a particular bid. Now, we can have a very interesting discussion as to whether, in addition, treat the obligations with respect to investor, investment protection are also owed directly to investors. But I think, as a, as a minimum, it's fair to say that because these are at base treaty obligations, that the obligations are owed in addition to the treaty partners between each other. This would suggest that there must be a mechanism by which those treaty partners can resolve disputes between them with respect to interpretation. 
Secondly, and I think probably more importantly, um, it doesn't make sense for the investor state arbitration process to be the sole means by which questions of interpretation can be settled. And the answer is pretty obvious. Questions of interpretation cannot be re definitively resolved by an investor state arbitration process. Why? Investor state arbitral awards do not create binding precedent. So they can't be said to determine with finality what the proper interpretation of the bit provision is with respect to the obligations owed between the treaty partners. In addition, relying upon an investor state process, investor state arbitration process to resolve disputes over interpretation also suffers from the fundamental problem that it requires an investor state arbitration to be launched in the first place. And in fact, there's no guarantee that this would actually, that this will happen. It doesn't make very much sense to have a system for resolving disputes over interpretation that is reliant upon the acts of third parties, which may never happen. And as we can all through, you know, you know, think about, um, there's many different reasons why an investor might not bring a case, you know, not least of which there may be no allegation of breach upon which um, such a obligation, such a, such a interpretive dispute could be brought before an arbitral tribunal. So it makes sense to have a system in which interpretive disputes can be resolved at the interstate level that is not dependent upon the decision of an investor to bring a case. Now, can I push you there though? Because I, I can understand not wanting it to just be investor state arbitration, but and I can understand saying it's not just about application. But part of the difficulty here is was there really a dispute between Ecuador and the United States, given that the United States didn't come forward and say, I disagree, it was silent. So I guess on the one hand, was, was there really a dispute about interpretation? And did it have any practical consequences, or was this, was this just hypothetical in a way that, that isn't really grounded in making a difference in your relationship with the United States? Well, I do think that there was a dispute between Ecuador and the United States. Um, and this gets into the particular facts and circumstances that, of, of the U.S. and Ecuador diplomatic relations um, to put a little bit more color on what I described before. Uh, in the circumstances of, of the case, Ecuador um, asked the United States for its interpretation, asked whether the United States agreed with Ecuador's interpretation, and said that if the U.S. doesn't answer, if the U.S. does not, uh, or you know, puts forth an interpretation that's at variance with Ecuador's interpretation, then quite obviously a dispute would exist that would enable Ecuador to bring a case to arbitration. Now, one can have a, an interesting discussion as to whether, um, in the particular facts and circumstances of, of this case, the U.S. silence uh, in the face of Ecuador's request gives rise to an inference of a dispute. This actually gets into a much wider debate in public international law as to under what circumstances the failure to articulate expressly um, a position can give rise to an inference of a dispute. And to, to step back j just a little bit in terms of, and to talk a little bit about the, about the definition of dispute in, in international law, um, it's well established that a dispute requires that there is to be positive opposition between two parties over a point of law or fact. This is well-established case law. But what the ICJ and other courts and tribunals have, have said quite clearly is that there does not need to be a specific express articulation that would place both sides in positive opposition. Instead, it's up to the court or tribunal to make an objective determination based on the facts and circumstances of the case at issue before it as to whether those facts and circumstances would give rise to an inference of a dispute. And in this case, Ecuador argued um, that in circumstances where the U.S. Um, base, where, where the bid at issue was based upon the U.S. model bid, where the bid, the draft bid was presented to Ecuador by the United States, that in those circumstances, it's reasonable to conclude that the U.S. has an interpretation of what the provision at issue means. And so then the question must, you know, must be asked, what reasonable interpretation could be given from the fact that the U.S. decided not to answer, in fact, affirmatively stated that it would not answer? In those circumstances, Ecuador made the case that an uh, inference of a dispute could be raised. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to turn at the moment now to Lee, who, who works for the Department of State, to ask, when, you, when you're faced with a claim like this from Ecuador, a novel claim, what is it that you're really objecting to about this state-to-state -state arbitration? What is it that concerns the United States about these sort of claims going forward, not just in this case, but more generally? Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks very much to the Valley Center and also to the CIA, CIA uh, for inviting me and also express the same caveat that I'm here in my personal capacity. So please don't be Peterson if you're out there. Please don't cite me as uh, representing the USU, although I was, I did work on the case and will do my best to channel uh, everything on that. So, concerns, yes. Um, we do think that there was a danger in uh, Ecuador's claim really on two fronts. We saw it as a threat both to uh, the system of investment treaties and the system of investment arbitration under those treaties. As to the threat to the system of investment treaties, uh, we felt that there were three important equities at stake. The first was the United States wanted to preserve its discretion under international law to decide whether or not it wanted to interpret a treaty, a bid, um, the US Act for a bid or any of its bids. Just like it concludes and amends treaties on the basis of mutual consent, we also like to interpret our treaties on the basis of mutual consent. Ecuador's claim in the U.S. view ran counter to that principle of mutuality and treaty making. Under Ecuador's theory, uh, as Andrew noted, Ecuador could simply ask the United States for an interpretation, and if the United States disagreed, or if it simply it was silent for whatever reason, um, Ecuador claimed that a dispute had arisen, it could go to a state-to-state -state tribunal and it could get what it called an authoritative interpretation that would bind the parties going forward. Um, this was uh, disconcerting to us uh, because, in essence, it was reading out a core limitation on the jurisdiction of state-to-state -state tribunals as we saw it. Um, and that is that state-to-state -state tribunals uh, not only uh, have jurisdiction over claims when the parties are in positive opposition, but there has to be, the question is, what are they in positive opposition to? They're in positive opposition to a concrete claim of treaty violation. And so we saw Article 7 as establishing only contentious jurisdiction uh, and not uh, any form of appellate, advisory, or referral jurisdiction. So we saw Ecuador's claim, and or its initial demand for an interpretation with this uh, decision or the statement that it could go to arbitration if we didn't reply the way Ecuador wanted um, is basically a way to stretch the scope of the uh, of Article 7 fit that had the uh, the state to state distinction and provision in order to achieve through arbitration what it wasn't able to achieve through uh, proper diplomatic channels. Um, because of course, you know, we, we believe that um, an interpretation has to be joint. Uh, made by the parties. So we did see this, the claim as an end run around uh, the principle of neutrality, and uh, we thought it was uh, uh, potentially an attempt to assert the role of the United States as one of the masters of the treaties, of the treaty in uh, interpreting the bit. So that was, um, that was the main concern. And further to this point, we also saw Ecuador's um, demand as circumventing fairly established a practice, um, which is to negotiate and agree, if possible, to an interpretation of a bid jointly. The NAFTA parties have always proceeded along these lines, and other countries have as well. I note that Argentina and Panama have uh, previously interpreted the bid by mutual consent. Can I stop you sure. on that? Because I can understand why the United States would say we should try to come to an agreement if we can, and you have previously come to an agreement um, under NAFTA. But it strikes me that you're most likely to get an interpretive agreement in a context like NAFTA where all of the states are likely to have investors bring cases and all of the states are likely to have uh, defensive interests that they themselves have been sued. So you, you have more common interest in coming together with agreements. I'm not sure that you have the same incentives to reach an agreement when you've got an investment treaty between Ecuador and the United States where, by and large, one side is going to be on the capital exporting side and one side is going to be on the capital importing side. And it's exactly in those situations, I think, that there may be a You don't think the United States is a capital importer? I think it is, but not necessarily with Ecuador. So I think I think in some of these treaties, I think where, where you're both an exporter and an importer vis-a-vis -vis each other, you're more likely to be able to reach an agreement. When there's a treaty where there's a clear exporter and a clear importer vis-a-vis -vis each other, I think it's harder to reach an agreement and so you're more likely to get 
um, a state to state arbitration. So I just wanted to push you a little bit on the agreement versus disagreement point. Well, I, I mean, I agree with, with Professor Reesman's comment, and also note that you know the United States and Mexico are also in different positions in terms of their uh, their uh, inward and outward investment. But I think the, the point is that. Um, under international law, based on the principle of mutuality, you have to try to, in good faith, uh, work together to reach an agreement. And it's not always the case that you will. Um, but to say that uh, when one disappointed party, uh, when one party is disappointed <coughs> in the course of discussions, they can then run to a state to state tribunal and have that tribunal make the decision for the, you know, if you want to call it the recalcitrant party. Um, we think is, is a significant threat to, uh, to treaty practice. So, would, that, would, would you then say that you could end up having a dispute in these sort of circumstances if Ecuador had gone through all of the diplomatic processes and in good faith tried to do consultations and after many years nothing had happened, then you could have a dispute? Or would you say that no. the US can actually no, no, see, stay they... silent and, and always prevent there being a dispute? Well. Here's the thing. I think I think the U.S. can um, uh, should have the right to stay silent if it chooses. It should also have the right to disagree and not be called into state-to-state -state arbitration. And this is one of the points that the U.S. made in its brief. There is a concreteness requirement to uh, to contentious jurisdiction. You can't simply take any disagreement uh, that two political officials might have and put it in, in an arbitral setting and have that tribunal determine what the state parties need to, to sort out themselves. So that was the point. So even if we had come out and disagreed flatly with uh, Ecuador's interpretation, we still don't think that there would have been uh, the concreteness that would have allowed for the uh, tribunal to have jurisdiction. Can I just come back to you then, Andrew? Because we, we, I raised the question about practical consequences and concreteness. <coughs> was there any? Y yes, there was. Um, the first point to make is that Fundamentally, these are questions about legal obligations that are owed between state parties. An arbitration arbitral tribunal that interprets the debt, where the express terms of the dispute resolution clause says that the award is final and it is binding on the parties, suggests that that interpretation is the authentic interpretation for purposes of the relationship between the two treaty parties. And so I think it's very difficult to say that a reward that interprets the bid that provides a binding resolution of a dispute with respect to the interpretation of a treaty provision doesn't have concrete effects or purposes of the treaty relationship between the two parties. So, if, I, if I may, I, I, think, I think though what that position does is it reads out uh, of the, the treaty of Article 7 um, the critical word dispute. Because this dispute under international law has a very special meaning. It's a term of art. And it basically means that it's in part uh, embodies the concreteness requirement, uh, which requires that one party has to be alleging that the other is acting inconsistently with its treaty obligations in order for there to be for a dispute to arise. So that was our concern. We thought Ecuador was reading that term out completely. And of course, there are other words in Article 7, which you have to read them in context. The phrase interpretation or application, in our view, meant once a dispute was established, um, for example, if, if Ecuador had accused the United States of breaching the treaty, um, then there would have been a dispute. Then the, the phrase interpretation or application would have allowed the tribunal the flexibility to resolve the issues no matter how they arose and how they were presented to the tribunal. Some cases will, and, and some litigants will emphasize issues of interpretation. Other cases and other litigants will emphasize issues of application. In most cases, you'll have a mix of both. But the point of that phrase, as we saw it, was to give the tribunal the latitude it needed to resolve any, any dispute that is a concrete claim that came before it um, fully. So, 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 just to just make one, one point on, on, on that issue. Oh. We said that, that a dispute, even if the two parties are in open disagreement with respect to the interpretation of the treaty, then, then that would not satisfy the requirements for a dispute for purposes of the dispute resolution clause. That helps to get flies in, in the face of the really plain and ordinary meaning of the dispute resolution clause. It says literally 
any dispute regarding interpretation or application of the treaty. Any dispute regarding interpretation. How can you read that to mean that the two parties openly say it means X, it means Y, that there's no adjudicative authority under the dispute resolution clause that would allow the tribunal to resolve that dispute? So one, and then I need to pull back. Sorry, I promised I wouldn't relitigate this. <laughs> yeah, that was just too much fun. Um, look, I think we would just respond by saying again, I don't think um, uh, that Ecuador um, viewed the term dispute with its full meaning. When we canvassed all the case law out there, we didn't find one case that's where a tribunal is actually resolving a question of interpretation purely in the abstract. There was always some underlying allegation or concern about treaty breach. And we found one quote from Judge Fitzmaurice in the Northern Cameroons case, which that case isn't exactly on point, but he was very aptly noted, uh, one, that courts of law are not there to make legal pronouncements in abstracto, he says. And then he went on to say, at a minimum, a dispute requires, quote, one party should be making or should have made a complaint, claim, or protest about an act, omission, or course of conduct of the other party. That's what we think uh, is an essential ingredient in the term dispute, and that's what we think Ecuador overlooked. So let me, let me pause back from the U.S. Ecuador case now, because you, you guys have been looking very closely at the language of, you know, dispute about the interpretation or application in the Ecuador-U.S. context. But of course, you can't read the state-to-state -state arbitration clause in isolation. And I think the point was best made, and I think it's been most um, best put forward generally in the literature so far by the expert opinion by Professor Reisman, which said you cannot read the state-to-state -state arbitration clause alone. You have to read it next to the investor-state arbitration clause and understand that different things might be allocated to the two different clauses, a dual track theory. So can I, can I pass to you, uh, Professor Reisman, to talk about the way in which you look at the investor state arbitration clause and the state state arbitration clause interacting and what that might mean to these sorts of cases? Thank you, Andrea. I will introduce an utterly neutral view as opposed to these two partisan positions. <laughs> And, and Thea, I, I apologize in the beginning because I do disagree with the, that part of the draft that you submitted to us, which I was able to read. Investment law has a long history because there have been foreign investments made. We have references in the Old Testament. We have references in treaties between Umar and Lagash. So this is a very long-term operation. And in customary international law had established the substantive rights to which investors as aliens were entitled quite a while ago. The innovation of contemporary international investment law is to be found in the fact that the disputes about whether or not the investor was accorded those customary rights which have now been codified in treaties, those disputes henceforth would be arbitrated at the initiative of the investor. They would no longer go to the foreign office or the State Department to be pressed at the diplomatic level. In other words, we move from politicization in modern investment law to the legalization or juridicalization of the resolution of this investment disputes. And this seems to me to be the major contribution of the international investment treaty genre of which there's some 3,000 cases, uh, examples of perhaps 2,800 in, in, in force. In the treaties, as Anthea said in her opening remarks, you find centrally the innovation that I've referred to, and that is the possibility of arbitrating disputes at the initiative of the investor with a coordinate commitment beforehand by the host state, each of the host states, that they would accede to the request for arbitration and would comply with the award that emerged. This strikes me as a central feature and one that I think plays a role in the, in the international investment uh, field, which now exceeds international trade in, in dollar figures. The, Survival in the treaty, the bilateral investment treaty, of a state-to-state -state 
arbitration option, in my view, cannot be interpreted in a way that allows that investor state option to be undermined or to be repoliticized. And with respect, Anthea, you mentioned two cases that precede Ecuador, United States. I think both of them would have done precisely that. Uh, the first that you mentioned, the uh, Peru-Chile initiative, which occurred in the, in the context of the Chedi case, was, I think, correctly characterized by Michaele, who is with us yes. electronically, yes. In, in his uh, very interesting piece in the American Journal of International Law, where he said, uh, the only known precedent in this field, other than the Italy-Cuba dispute, is the interstate arbitration initiated by Peru uh, pursuant to the Chile-Peru bid <coughs> in an attempt to block or hinder an ongoing investor state arbitration where Peru was the respondent. That is exactly what was going on in that case. And the arbitration, the investor state arbitration tribunal effectively brushed it off. <coughs> the other case that Anthea mentioned, the Italian-Cuban case, I think is misinterpreted. And here, Michele, with, with respect, I don't agree with the, your characterization of paragraph 67 of the, the critical paragraph of the jurisdictional decision. In that particular case, it was, a, first of all, a very strange bilateral investment treaty. There really was no investor arbitration option. Article 9 allowed investors to bring claims, but then they poured the procedure into <coughs> Article 10, which was the state-to-state -state procedure. And the parties actually, the state-to-state -state procedure required that for the investment arbitration, the states would appoint the arbitrators and the states would cover the costs and actually play a major role. And the question, the critical question was, when the state does this, can it pursue both its the spousal claims for injuries that it suffered under the old fiction of diplomatic protection of nationals, while also allowing the investors to pursue their claims. And as I read paragraph 67, I have the French version here, the, the tribunal said explicitly that the condition for bringing the state-to-state -state diplomatic espousal was that the resortisants, that is the nationals, were not suscept had not made themselves susceptible to international arbitration under Article 10. So that's something I, I should say that is left out of your American Journal, very interesting American Journal note. If I can just summarize my own position, the state-to-state -state arbitration, in my view, is concerned with obligations in the treaty between the states. With respect to Andrew, I don't agree that a bilateral investment treaty is just an agreement between states with obligations reciprocal to the states' parties. I think, here I'd like to quote an article that I did with Marjar Sanjani, who's in the audience, that international, that bilateral investment treaties are treaties for the benefit of third parties, and they're designed to induce or to encourage investors. Sorry. To, to, encourage, to encourage investors to make investments on the basis of the assurances given by each of the states. So there are indeed obligations interstate, but there are critical obligations in which the states agree to provide benefits to third parties, and in addition, provide a mechanism whereby those individual parties can vindicate those rights. Thank you. So, so Mikhail, um, I think yes. a number of interesting Can you hear me? I can hear you. The one thing I'll ask you is, um, we can hear you well. When, when, when it's not your turn to speak, if you can mute yourself, because we can hear your papers as well. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes. We, we thought you were going to leap out for a moment. <laughs> can, I, can I turn to you? Um, could you talk to us a little bit about this Italy and Cuba case and what sort of a precedent 
the NPA is? Is it the precedent that you can have diplomatic protection <coughs> under investment treaties? Or is it a narrow one just because of this unusual Middle East Cuba bit? I think there's a disagreement between you and Professor Reese here. So could you talk about this case? Yes, sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Antia, for for insisting on having me on, on this panel. And I, unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person, but it's great that we've managed, nonetheless, to, to have it through Skype. Um, so it, I, I agree with, with Professor Riesman that the uh, the clause in the in the Italy Cuba BAT is a very unusual clause, to say the least. Uh, it's not a masterpiece of, of treaty drafting, but what, what, I, what I think it says, so we have one clause, which is Article 10, which is the, the so to say, normal state-to-state -state, uh, dispute settlement clause, but then we have an, uh, an Article 9, which is entitled um, Settlement of Disputes between a contracting party and, a, and an investor of the other contracting party, according to which, and I translate, a dispute may be submitted at the choice of the investor to either the, the, the home state courts or to an arbitral tribunal, pursuant to, and then there is a, a humbra to the norms, to the provisions of the interstate tribunal. So what I thought that that would mean is that the uh, investor has a choice, has an option, otherwise what would it, would it mean to, to say that uh, it has may be submitted at the choice of the investor when in fact there would be no choice if the, the only avenue would be diplomatic protection to the state-to-state -state, um, model. Um, so the, but the, the tribunal has to be constituted the same way as the interstate. Now, of course, mutatis mutandis addition would have been uh, nice to uh, uh, avoid some awkward results, but uh, nonetheless, I think that's the, the, the reading. And uh, if I look at the, the awards, uh, the, the interim awards of 2005 and the, the, the final award of 2008 by the tribunal, I, I think that's also how the tribunal interpreted it. And also the parties, none of the parties argued that there was uh, no investor state arbitration. It would have been much easier is for one of the parties to argue that, but none of the parties seem to have argued that. And the tribunal proceeds on the uh, on the assumption uh, that there are both both of these options. Otherwise, all the discussion on which maybe uh, we will turn later on the coordination between the two and the possible interplay and, and, and overlap would make would make very little sense in my opinion. So I I, I don't know. I, I think um, I think although not badly drafted, it, it, it provided for for uh, both options. But of course, this is something that we uh, we, we can discuss now. For the for the um, more general significance uh, of the Italy Cuba, I think we can note uh, Italy Cuba case. We can note two things. Uh, of course, accepting that it was this double uh, double track. Um, first is the the way uh, the tribunal views the institution of diplomatic protection. I think uh, I was rereading the case the other day in preparation for this panel. I think it, the tribunal makes some interesting. Um, considerations, maybe not all uh, that they can be uh, agreed on, but nonetheless they are interesting. And the second, uh, the second issue that I think also would be interesting to discuss for us is the um, the possible interplay between investor state uh, dispute settlement and diplomatic protection type of claims under state to state. And I think also there it will really make interesting uh, considerations. Um, so maybe, maybe if I can just say a few words on the on how the tribunal views the, the, the diplomatic protection, or if you have questions, Antje, um, I don't know how you want to proceed. Well, I think um, so. So the question I wanted to ask is is the Article Twenty Seven question, which is that yes. Article Twenty Seven of ICSID says that no contracting state will give diplomatic protection if one of its investors has already brought a claim. So we very clearly have the idea that you can't have a state-to-state -state arbitration after you've already got an investor-state arbitration initiated. But I guess that raises um, two questions for me. Uh, the first is, does that mean that state-to-state -state arbitration you can never have, or does it simply mean you can't have it if there has been a specific investor-state arbitration already bought? Is it that it's pulled out because there is the possibility of investor-state arbitration, or because there was actually a specific <coughs> investor-state arbitration? And then the other is to flip Article 27 on its head. What happens if the investor state arbitration if the investor state arbitration comes first, you can't have a state to state arbitration. But what if a state to state arbitration comes first? Would that preempt having an investor state arbitration? So let me turn to you on your interpretation of Article 27. And I think there are some other people in the panel who have a view on Article 27 and what it means in this context. 
Uh, yes, so basically Article 27 is a, is a provision, as I understand it, on, on sequencing that we find in the exit convention, so in a very specific framework, which is the exit convention, which was not the framework that we had in the Italy-Cuba case, because Cuba is not a party to the, to the exit convention, so that, that was not directly applicable, but as we will see, it pops up nonetheless. Um, the Article 7, what Article 7 says is basically, once uh, both the investor and the uh, home state have consented to submit or have submitted the dispute uh, to, in this case, exit arbitration, uh, then the home state is barred uh, from exercising the diplomatic protection unless uh, there is an issue with the, with the failure to, of the home state to comply with the, with the award. Now, um, even the text is pretty clear that you need a mutual consent because they say an investor and a contractor say, although I think uh, there is some discrepancy between the travaux, which seem to imply something different, also the report seems to say something different, they seem to imply the idea that uh, just access to exit would be enough to, um, to, to bar diplomatic protection. What I think Article, 20, Article 27 was drafted with contractual arbitration in mind, where you had mutual consent in, a, in the same instrument. Of course, there, were no, there was no arbitration without privity, uh, according to the BIT, that would have come later. But nonetheless, um, otherwise also there would be no sense to make a difference between consented and submitted to consent, with each, which in case of arbitration without privity actually uh, coincide. Uh, but I, I agree that the, the text of Article 27 in the end is clear, and you, are, you need mutual consent, uh, which means under the with a previous scenario, you need the investor to have filed the request for arbitration uh, uh, for Article 27 to come into play. Um, so that is the, is, the, is the exit scenario. So this doesn't mean that diplomatic protection is always uh, is always prohibited. Uh, there is an express exception um, for the failure to, to abide and comply with the, with the award. Uh, but also, as I said, it, there is a temporal limitation, which is only after the investor has uh, co co consented or has submitted a dispute to, to the arbitral tribunal. But this is this is under under the exit framework, which is pretty clear. What would happen if we are outside of that framework? That is much more uncertain, I think. And then there was one the case in, in the Italy Cuba uh, case. So you could either have one of the, the contracting parties not being a party to exit. That would be one scenario. You could also have both contracting parties uh, being party to exit, but the BIT that is an issue would uh, would allow for different types of investor state uh, options, ANSI 12, SEC, ICC, uh, and, and so on. And in that case, if the investor files a request pursuant to those other rules, of course, uh, Article 27 does not directly come into play. So that is why I think the what, what was interesting is to see how the early Cuba uh, tried to address this issue and it made some interesting consideration because it said that in, in, in the Italy Cuba we, we, we didn't have any uh, rule on, on coordination unlike we have in other uh, in other BITs. So in other BITs you find some rules that tell you what to do uh, when you have investor state and state to state arbitration proceedings. What the tribunal nonetheless said is it found that as long as the investor had not consented to international arbitration uh, with, with the whole state, its right to diplomatic protection persists. Now this is maybe a little bit of a, of a slip of the tongue because of course the, the, the investor has no right to diplomatic protection. Even if one uh, adheres to the view that underlying rights are those of the investors, and this we can maybe discuss, um, but of course it's, it, it, diplomatic protection remains a, a sovereign property of the state. But anyway, uh, it says that basically if, if, the, if it has not consented, then its right to diplomatic protection could persist, and it applied by analogy, by analogy, uh, it said in paragraph 65, uh, Article 27, which maybe uh, from a methodological point of view is somehow questionable because, of course, as I said, Cuba was not bound uh, by, by that treaty. So um, this is, this is, these are maybe the main findings that we can, uh, we, we can, we can see from the, from the tribunal. So can I jump in here to sort of open it up to our panelists, particularly Professor Eastman and also um, uh, Andrew Brockman. Um, and I'm just going to which is, how do you understand Article 27? Does Article 27 actually envisage that you can have state to state arbitration and investor state arbitration, but just not at the same time? Or, or does, it, does the existence of investor state arbitration preclude state to state arbitration? Andrew? 
Well, thank you, Matthew. Thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I mean, my reading of Article 27 is that it is designed to achieve two objectives, uh, possibly more. One is to avoid duplicative proceedings, uh, and another is to effectuate the depoliticization of disputes. Uh, including, you know, espousal uh, of disputes and the political considerations that go into the foreign minister's office about deciding whether or not it wants to espouse. So, uh, given that, and read, given the um, kind of context of Article 26, uh, Article 27, including Article 26, which says that the, you know, which says that the investors consent to arbitration is the exclusion of any other remedy. I think that affects somewhat the interpretation of Article 27, and then the notion is that you have this one remedy, it is investor status new settlement. Once you have launched it, that is the, you know, that is the, the route down which you are traveling. Um, what if you haven't launched it? If you haven't launched it, I think there's absolutely nothing that would prevent the state from starting an investment, uh, an you could choose if you're the investor. You can choose to go to exit. I mean, so you, you have the consent of the, the host state. You can choose to go to investment arbitration, or you can go to your foreign ministry and say, "Won't well, you espouse my claim?" So here's but, the, the difficult situation, which right. is one is one is if you choose to go to investor state arbitration. Another is that you choose to ask your home state to go to state to state arbitration. Right. What if your home state goes to state to state arbitration and you don't like the way it's prosecuting the claim, or well, you didn't ask it to go? Can you bring your own investor state arbitration claim afterwards? Uh, my first, well, uh, practically speaking, my guess is you would be time barred by the time you figured out that there was something wrong with that. But I, I would say that principles of estoppel might prevent you from doing that if you had chosen to take a different route. But it would, I mean, it would depend a lot on what the what your government had done and on a lot of factual circumstances, right? I mean, I don't know if you can give an answer in the abstract. I won't take the very difficult question that you've just posed to Andrea, but I'd like to go back to the question of what Article 27 means. And I, I don't think that it's particularly recondite. The, the report of the executive directors, which was issued at the time the uh, text was finalized, said, with respect to Article 27, nor does it empower a state to institute proceedings before the court, in because the reference is to the international court, in respect of a dispute which one of its nationals and another contracting state have consented to submit or have submitted to arbitration, since such proceedings would contravene the provisions of Article 27 unless the other contracting state had failed to abide by and comply with the award rendered in that dispute. I think the ICSID model which I may indeed, as Michele pointed out, not be relevant to the Italian-Cuban case, is quite clear as far as ICSID is concerned, and I think quite clear as far as my conception of the bilateral investment dual-track jurisdiction is concerned. So I, I want to push, though, on, um, on the hard case that nobody seems to want to answer, right? So let me, let me posit this case to you, which is when there is a difference of interest between the home state and the investor, and I, I want to give the scenario of the Iran-US claims, uh, the Iran-US hostages crisis, right? So you have a situation where there is a, a clear threat to US nationals, nationals, uh, US nationals are being held hostage, and there are a lot of claims against Iran, and as a way to strike a deal to get out of that situation, uh, the US actually agrees to settle for the US domestic claims that have been brought against Iran. Now, under old world diplomatic protection rules, you could probably do that, and the US Supreme Court found in that case, you could do that provided that you did set up something like the Iran-US claims tribunal. I want to imagine an Iran-US hostages case now, but Iran and US having an investment treaty. A situation where the investors might want to pursue investor state arbitration, but a state might want to do a group settlement on behalf of its investors. And this kind of raises the difficult question, who owns these rights? Are these rights that belong to the investors so the home state can't compromise them? 
or are these rights that belong to the home state, so the home state can <coughs> compromise them? Or are the rights somehow shared between the home state and the investor? Who wants to, who wants to cut in on, on the, the hard case scenario? I think it's an easy case, Cynthia. Do you? <laughs> Bilateral investment treaties, and here we go back to the point that I differed with Andrew over. <coughs> Bilateral investment treaties create benefits for third parties. Those rights vest in the third parties. They can't be taken away. And incidentally, if I may quote, I may be quoting you, Andrew. I, I went through the record of the, uh, the pleadings that were discovered, and this was, as far as I could tell, precisely what Ecuador was actually trying to do in the case. I may be quoting you, I don't know who said this. To the extent that the interpretation might be said to benefit Ecuador in comparison with the interpretation given by the Chevron Tribunal, it would in equal measure benefit the, benefit the United States. To the extent that the burden of Article 2.7, that is the FPT provision, on Ecuador would be reduced, it would likewise be reduced for the United States. In that regard, it is worth noting that in its own model bid promulgated in 2004 and included by the US in its subsequent bids with other states, the United States completely unburdened itself of Article 2.7 by eliminating it from these treaties. The game and the implication of the hypothetical that you're posing to us would be essentially to disenfranchise investors that relied in good faith on treaty commitments that were made for their benefit and designed to induce them to risk capital in a place where they might not otherwise have done so. So someone thinks it's an easy case. And do you think it's an easy or a hard case? I think it's hard, but perhaps not as hard as you think it is. I think I tend to agree with, with Michael. I mean, I agree that the investors have, uh, are uh, reasonably viewed as third party beneficiaries of treaties, which means they do have rights conferred on them by the states to the treaty. And those rights, once conferred, belong to the investor. The question, of course, remains, what, what is the content of those rights? How extensive are they? Are they in any way qualified, let us say, by the, the home state's ability to let's swoop in, step in, and try to engage in a, let's say, a diplomatic settlement in your Iran hostages uh, scenario, for example. And it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't seem to me that they did that. We might think that it would have been a good idea to do that, or we might not. It depends on where we sit. But uh, it doesn't seem to me clear that the states have, in fact, uh, uh, limited the rights that they conferred on the investors. And indeed, one might reasonably say that the whole purpose of the investment treaty is to avoid those very questions. Um, I point out that in a um, uh, in, well, first with respect to Dames and Moore versus, uh, versus Reagan, the U.S. Supreme Court case that upheld the decision in the um, Iran hostages case, they made clear, it's funny reading it, it's a little bit like Bush versus Gore, they say we're really only deciding the narrowest of questions, this should not be taken too far out of context, they emphasize the severe kind of foreign policy threat. Uh, they emphasize the narrowness of the holding. They also emphasize that all they are uh, supporting is the suspension of the claims in before U.S. courts. They're not terminating the claims before U.S. courts. Uh, so, you know, by even if you were to go there by analogy, this, the analog would be the suspension of the investors' claim before the treaty under the treaty as opposed to the termination of the investors' claim under the treaty. But I think here's another important distinction, and then here's where um, I think I agree with Michael, too, is that when Dames and Moore versus Reagan was decided in 1981, the United States did not have any investment treaties yet. So that that question did not even uh, arise uh, for, the, for, the tri uh, for, for the court. Um, and not wanting to opine on what the U.S. Supreme Court might do if it gets its hand on an, hands on an investment treaty case. Uh, but uh, I, I think that, that the landscape has changed. You know, they quoted the restatement second of the U.S. foreign relations law that said, of course, governments can settle claims on behalf of their nationals, even if the nationals don't like what they do. But I think that, that's precisely what you said. That's in the old days in the protection context. That's not in the investment treaty context. 
So let me ask, are you going to come in on this one? <laughs> Do I have a uh, absolutely. Um, I had a sort of a follow-up question to Professor Reeson's um, statement. I'm wondering, I think, I think at least from a government's perspective, um, they would say, yes, we can do this. And Daniels and Moore says you can, right, because part of the U.S. Congress had, had acquiesced to this longstanding uh, executive power. Um, but the question now is when you introduce a bid right, uh, how do you go about doing that? Is it enough to do it just by executive agreement? Um, has the Congress acquiesced in, in that when at the same time they've, they've blessed this investor right in, in a bit? Um, can you even go, can, can the President go back to Congress and, and amend the bid and, and terminate uh, maybe ongoing bid claims? Do you really that's any question? Yeah, because I think, can I just say about the idea, I, I think that Professor Risman really has a point, and it's a point that was made in his article with Panush Asanjani, which is that these are these are a new brand of treaties, right? The old style treaties that are just state to state and only state to state right obligations, you understand that the treaty parties have tremendous powers to vary, modify, terminate, because it's really only concerning the rights and obligations of those treaty parties. But when we're dealing with treaties that create potentially third party rights and third party benefits, then you might want to have some limitations on the power of the treaty parties. But the question is, how far does that limitation go? So if you take the third party beneficiary um, example under domestic contract law, if, if Lee and I, for example, enter into a contract and we give an enforceable right to somebody else, the, the usual presumption of my understanding under contract law of a variety of states is that we can actually agree to amend or terminate or revoke that right except in two situations. One is when the third party has accepted the right, so for example by bringing a claim, and the other is when they have relied upon the right. And there's a difference here potentially between the possibility of reliance and actual reliance. So I think, I think if investors have very clearly specifically relied upon an investment treaty in making their investment, you, they would have a very strong case here to say there's detrimental reliance. Uh, but, but in a number of these cases, that's not the situation. It's a pre-existing investment, or they weren't aware of the treaty, or it wasn't integral to their thinking. So I think there really is something in this third-party beneficiary analysis. But my sense is I don't go as far with it as you do. And I, my, my other sense is that most states, and we've got two representatives who represent states here, would want to retain some power to do exactly what I was suggesting in the Iran hostages case. And if you've got states wanting to retain that power, is that relevant to how we interpret these treaties? Andrew. Yeah, I just want to pick up on a point that, that Andrea mentioned, which is that to the extent that investors have that vested right, it's a question of what is the content of those vested rights. They don't have the right to an erroneous interpretation of a bid. They have a right to the authentic interpretation of, of the bid. And so the question arises, what happens when a tribunal interprets a bid in a way that at least one state party views is erroneous? If you, and this, this relates to the, the quote that Professor Reisman um, mentioned about the issue of unburdening states of these issues. We're not going to refer to the unburdening of itself and the reciprocal benefit of the unburdening of the United States. What it's referring to is the burden of having to de facto potentially apply an erroneous interpretation of the bid. Now, recall in the context of, of the Ecuador US dispute, the underlying tribunal, the original tribunal, had <coughs> interpreted the bid to mean that certain obligations go beyond customary international law. What that means is Ecuador is under the potential burden of having to apply that interpretation in its judiciary. That's a burden. And it's a burden that also potentially applies to the other state party. And so the question is, how do you address this problem of erroneous interpretations? An investor may have a right to the protection of the subs substantive, uh, substantive obligations contained in bids, but they don't have a right to erroneous interpretations of those obligations. So this comes back more generally to an idea that so what are the rights? Yeah, if you could just mute well. Um, Sorry, no, I just wanted to make a comment on the when it, uh, yes, no, uh, maybe just, just wanted to think on, on what you were uh, saying on wars, the rights, and, and, and these questions. And my question is, um, we know that we, that we have some clauses in the BITs uh, that tell us what happens if one party unilaterally terminates the, the BIT, right? So we, 
we have differences again, but we, we have some patterns to tell us if one party unilaterally uh, exits the, the treaty, then you have these survival clauses whereby the, um, the investors would uh, in, continue to enjoy their rights for a number of years, five years, 10 years, 15 years. That, that's basically the, these are the patterns. But they don't tell us what happens uh, if both parties agree to terminate the VAT. And don't these survival clauses mean, a contrario, that First, they, they, they tell us that you continue to enjoy rights, but it's not forever, it's just for a number of years. And second, they don't tell us anything about the bilateral, the mutual termination, which I would take to understand that if the parties agree to mutually terminate the VAT, that that cannot have the same consequences as having a, 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 as a unilateral termination would have. So, I don't know, maybe a question for, for, the, for the other panelists, what do they think of this? I'm also very interested in this idea, but we've got some questions from the audience. I can see two. I'm going to start at the front and then head to the back. So. I uh, had not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, I'm glad you raised the Iran-US claim strike bill because it had a few techniques that might be useful in terms of state-to-state uh, -state arbitration. And what it did was to establish in the Algiers courts the basic treaty three categories of claims. There were the investor claims, which of course are numerous claims. There were state to state claims, not so numerous, but very important. And then there were the interpretation claims, all three. And so the government, if it had a question of interpretation, could raise it and get an authoritative answer. Not necessarily a correct answer. It might be erroneous. It's the full tribunal. That doesn't mean it's right. Um, so there's no guarantee of a correct answer, no matter who's giving it. Um, you could also have state-to-state -state claims. And this tribunal's now been operating for 31 years, and those claims are still there. The Iranians have a huge, what they call the foreign military sales claim against the United States. It's enormous. It's still there. Um, uh, part of these state-to-state uh, -state claims have been settled. Investor claims, most of them have been adjudicated, some have been settled, and those claims are done. Uh, so what's remaining are the state-to-state -state and the interpretive claims. Now you say, well, it's one tribunal. Yes, but the tribunal keeps changing. 31 years is a long time. People retire, they die. Uh, they go on to something different, and that's happened uh, to this tribunal over these 31 years. So is this a kind of model that could be used in a future state-to-state -state arbitration setting? Possibly, it's not likely. George described it earlier today as an outlier. Maybe it is, but it shows a certain amount of promise and techniques that could be used, could be thought of. It took us a long time today before you used the phrase Iran US claims tribunal. I thought we'd never get to it. So, uh, and that's what usually happens. We don't get to it, but it's there. So can I say on this, I'm, I'm as these people know on the panel, I'm, I'm working on a paper at this the moment, and, and this is exactly the model that I pull out as a model that we can look at because it does a couple of interesting things. The, the category A claims, which are the interpretive disputes, I think there are two things that are particularly interesting about them. The first is that if there had already been an, an investor state claim before one of the three-person panels, uh, and there was a decision on interpretation, that decision stands. But if there's then an interpretive dispute, a pure question of interpretation could go to all nine members of the court and they could get an authoritative interpretation which would bind future tribunals but wouldn't necessarily overturn a previous decision. So that can raise interesting issues of equities and can also give you a way of actually getting to an answer on an interpretation that might be binding prospectively but not retrospectively. Um, can I, just before I start you on, George, can I come to back? I think Luke's got a question. I do. Um, I was going to ask a Professor York, and Professor Reed. Could you speak louder, please? Sure. Um, a question for Pro Professor Reisman and Professor Bjorkland. Um, one possible solution to the scenario that Anthea had painted dealing with a diplomatic settlement in the hostages type situation 
but where there's a BIT in place and where you have this possibility of the individual nationals bringing claims. One possible solution is what the Czech Republic has done to terminate some of its bilateral investment treaties, including its investment treaty with Italy, where they've not done a unilateral termination, but they've both terminated the treaty. But prior to doing so, they amended it so that the survival clause is no longer operative. And I'm wondering what legal effects uh, Professor Reisman and Professor Bjorklin might view you know, such an approach as having and whether that might put a stop sign in front of, you know, create a dead end for claimants to try to bring BIT claims if the treaty has been terminated and terminated in the way that I've described where the survival mechanism is no longer operative. Can I go on by the sir? If I may say first, Andrea, Danes and Moore really was an expropriation case. It was a Fifth Amendment case. And it would have been peculiar if there had been an injunction issued against the president not to proceed with the, uh, the Algiers Accord. But it would have been perfectly understandable if the court had said, we don't believe that the Algiers Accord will produce results comparable to those available to US claimants in the United States courts. And therefore, the United States will be contingently liable. Well, Justice, Powell, Justice Powell, in a separate opinion, suggested, suggested that. And so, Justice Stevens, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Arthur, before I address Luke's point, Arthur and, and Anthea, I think the, the Iran-US claims model, and I with great care, take up an issue with the first United States agent before the, the, the commission. Arthur Robot. Uh, I think the situation there was unlike a bit in the sense that you had a set of claims that were, were from the past, and this was just a procedure to resolve them. And so I don't think anyone's sense of justice would have been offended if the states fine-tuned the procedure as it proceeded. But there would be no deprivation of expectation rights that investors might have had. That's different than a bilateral investment treaty, which in theory tells a potential investor that it will have access to a particular forum at its election, which will apply certain rights under international law. And this becomes a factor in its decision to, in theory, in its decision to proceed to invest. So I'm not sure that the interpretation provision in the Algiers Accords would be particularly helpful, or the unsubtrolled adaptation would be particularly helpful in the problem we're dealing with. Look, if I could just comment on this, and I'm sure I'm going to say something very similar to what Andrea would say. If the treaty stated this in the beginning, that every investor is on notice <coughs> that this is susceptible to adjustment, in much the same way that every investor who looks to looking to NAFTA appreciates that the Free Trade Commission will at some point have the option of stepping in and making an adjustment. I think it becomes problematic only in circumstances in which there had been no such notice in the original treaty, nothing like a free trade commission provision that you find in chapter 11. And in these circumstances, it seems to me that it would be perfectly lawful for the investor to say that you cannot take away its tail right, that is its right to, for the additional 10 years, if it relied on it. I take your point <coughs> earlier. None of this involves changes pro futuro. It only involves changes retroactively that do not improve the status of the investor, but take something from it. Um, well, I, I would just say, I, I guess I would say, Luke, it's not clear to me that it matters whether you amend the treaty and then terminate the treaty, or if you just terminate the treaty all at once and then terminating it, say, we're bilateral <coughs> terminating the treaty, and therefore we concluded there are no tail rights. I mean, I, I don't think that's a procedural mechanism that should change the outcome. I, I mean, I, I'm reminded of the, you know, the provisions in most treaties about the measurement of compensation for uh, illegal expropriation, or for, for, for expropriation, to render an expropriation lawful. 
and the failure of the treaties to specify what the measure would be if the appropriation were unlawful, right? I mean, this assumption is you, most treaties provide that you get uh, the U.S. whole formula prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, and that renders an expropriation lawful. They don't deal with what extra you might get in the event of an unlawful expropriation. And certainly there's a strand of thought that says the you know, the, if you have full reparations with respect to getting prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, you don't get anything else, right? I mean, you, and maybe that was an oversight. Maybe they should have said something. And I suppose I, I hypothesize that the notion that if one party unilaterally terminates a treaty, then and only then are there tail rights, but in the event of a bilateral termination, there are not any, I suspect, was not intended by the treaty drafters with the idea being that um, you needed to make a specification when one party did something uh, untoward, but that both parties would, at least one party in almost any given circumstance would want to maintain the rights of the investor. But uh, I mean, that, it's an interesting, I mean, it's a, it's a fact, I think that's a fascinating, um, uh, I think that's a fascinating question. I, I would uh, add, I mean, that we, uh, maybe uh, you remember this, but one of the, uh, an analogous thing, uh, settlement happened in with respect to the softwood lumber cases. There were three NAFTA Chapter 11 cases submitted against the United States having to do with the never-ending dispute between the United States and Canada over uh, softwood lumber exports from Canada to the United States. And in the settlement agreement for Lumber 4, I think it was then, uh, we're on Lumber 5 now, but I think that was Lumber 4, uh, the three part of the settlement agreement was that the Canadian claimants against the United States would renounce their, their Chapter 11 uh, claims against the United States, and they all signed the agreement, so they were formally part of the settlement agreement. I believe that the position of the Canadian government was that while that wasn't, I don't think they took a position on whether that was necessary um, to waive the claims, but everybody thought it was desirable. And I suppose on that front, I, I just note that we are, have been speaking as if the interests of the investor and the interests of the investor's home state are almost are always going to be in opposition to each other. And I don't think that's necessarily, I mean that's not necessarily going to be the case. I mean one um, certainly in the with respect to the Iran of Us Claims Tribunal, and Arthur knows much more about that than I do. But there were some disgruntled investors uh, but, uh, uh, who wanted to pursue their claims in U.S. courts and not uh, in The Hague. But it's not the case that in a, in a mass claim situation that the, the claimants are necessarily unhappy and not willing to perhaps take a smaller bite of the apple if there's indeed a lump sum settlement agreement arranged and the claimants are going to get a part of it. I think people, even if they might be able to assert a different right or to, to make another analogy to domestic law to assert some kind of opt out with respect to a class action, they might very well not do that thinking that they're better off getting sense, you know, some cents on the dollar rather than risking a lot perhaps to get more and perhaps to get nothing. So I, I completely agree that, that in many circumstances the home state and the investor will have common interests. I, I pose the situation where their interests are different because I think it brings to light more clearly what happens about whose rights they are and who has control. But let me, there have been a number of questions in the audience. Can I first turn to George and then to Raheem and then to Kabir for questions from the audience? So George. The conversation has opened me to things a little bit, but um, a word on the Iran Claims Tribunal. In addition to the point Michael made, which I think is very trendy, uh, about the, you know, the sequencing, the timing here of the being cast claims. I do think that one would have to give, and I would recommend that as you study the matter, to give thought to the, the, the composition of the, of, of the tribunal. Uh, it's hard for me to imagine that um, the Iran claims tribunal would be viewed as comparable, or I should put it differently, um, a, a, a tripartite a tribunal of, of three privately um, constant, a constant, privately constituted um, tribunal is going to be speaking for the states 
Um, it, may be, it may be problematic enough that somebody else is speaking for the states, but it, there's something about the composition of the tribunal that gives me a comfort that I maybe shouldn't have, but I have decidedly less comfort. Um, now, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be done, but it seems to me that before you embrace it, uh, it should be recognized that there's some, the, the privatization, uh, the privatization of the interpretation of the treaties uh, and the privatization in, in three individual sets of hands is something I'd want to think about. The other point is very quick. I, I quite agree with, with what seems to be a little bit of a consensus emerging here that the um, espousal should not extinguish the possibility of um, institution of an investor state arbitration. I just wanted to suggest maybe we could explore how that plays out then. I would assume that if that were the case, that if the state was espousing and only espousing, had been espousing and only espousing, the espousal ends. I, I'd like to have reaction to that if time permitted. Um, do we really want the espousal as such to go on concurrently? It would seem to me the espousal would end. It was initiated at the request of the investor. The investor has withdrawn the request for an espousal. It's deemed to have by initiating arbitration. That does not mean, however, that James Reagan can't happen. That doesn't mean that we can't have a settlement process that's put into place with whatever consequences the Constitution may be required. But I, I, do you, in fact, um, infer from your own proposal that the espousal would come to an immediate end? The espousal as such. Okay. I'm going to try to raise two questions before we open up. So, Rahim. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but three, uh, two short questions. Uh, the first is, um, with respect to the state arbitration um, as it relates to the interpretation of the treaties, I guess on a more fundamental level, my question is, what relevance would that necessarily have to future disputes? Because, um, you know, I think this goes to a point that Lee was talking about, the concretization of the dispute. One of the reasons for that, it seems to me, would be that the arbitrators are only there to resolve the dispute before them. And insofar that that's the case, to what extent would a future tribunal deciding a case between an investor and state be bound by that interpretation? I don't see that as an authentic interpretation because under Article 31 of the Vienna Convention, that doesn't that's not one of the interpretive mechanisms. So it doesn't come under the only thing that would perhaps be closest to the Article 31 3 A and B, subsequent agreement and practice, which it's not. It's not subsequent agreement and it's not a subsequent practice establishing the agreement of the parties, it's actually the exact opposite, showing that there's a divergence of opinion. So I would suggest that future tribunals actually wouldn't necessarily even be bound, so it doesn't really, it's kind of a moot point when there isn't a concrete dispute. Um, so that's that's point number, question number one. The second is, I wonder on the US-Ecuador case specifically, um, I haven't had a chance to read the pleadings, I apologize, it's uh, a lot of reading, which I'm sure your class had to, had to go through. Um, but uh, and, and I'll, I'll embraced, embraced, embraced. Yeah. That, that, that and more. That's that, that, that and more. That and more. Okay. Well, <laughs> at this point in my career, it's like actually fun reading, so I will read something. But um, Article Five of the bit, it seems to me, actually dealt with um, consultations between the parties and an obligation to consult between the parties when there was uh, when one of the parties raised a question of interpretation. So I wonder what it was raised by Ecuador. Or um, that the U.S. had to respond um, to their request under Article 5. And if they didn't, then to bring a claim to say, we disagree on the interpretation of Article 5. Um, and that they must have, they should have responded, and we bring a claim for them to respond, because there was obviously a disagreement on that. Um, so those are my two questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to hold for a second and get some responses, and then we'll um, come to you. So, uh, but the last question maybe was posed maybe to you, Andrew. Sure, I'll try and try and hit all the questions that, that you asked. Um, first, what is the relevance of the state state award for future conduct, future for future tribunals? I think there are a number of subparts to, to the answer. The first is that, as I said before, it would establish the obligations that are owed between the states to each other. Clearly, the states of the arbitration clause says that it would result in a binding award 
in relation to interpretation. And so that interpretation thus becomes the binding interpretation vis-a-vis -vis the state parties to each other. And that can have a number of different consequences, one of which would be, I would suggest, that it could constrain the ability of a state to bring a diplomatic protection claim um, on behalf of investors from its state, and it really ins insofar as it would constrain the types of interpretations that could be put forward by that state in a, in a future case. Um, but it also may have relevance for um, future investor state tribunals, which is not to say that it would be binding, but at the very least, I would suggest that it would be highly persuasive authority. Um, well, Rahim, I like the way you think. I wish you were on the U.S. team with us. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you come at this from the perspective that the tribunal only has contentious jurisdiction, then its decision cannot extend beyond, uh, you know, what it decides as to the parties with respect to the, the issues of law and fact before it in a particular case. So, you know, after that, there's no sorry to cease in, in, uh, in investment law. There's really nothing that carries it forward. Um, and, and if you if you also accept this this view that the tribunal only has contentious jurisdiction, then and there's really this um, peculiar imbalance that results from from Ecuador's approach because what Ecuador was was hoping for was this authoritative interpretation, and presumably you know they were they were hoping it was going to go in their way, and it might be something new uh, that might narrow the scope of um, Article 27, which was you know offensive to them, um, and it would put them in a better position than they were in before the arbitration started. And that sort of goes against your international law preparations where your, your idea is to sort of make the, the party whole, not to enhance the position. So, um, but I, I don't know, may I ask that question? Yeah. I don't want to hijack. No, 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 so I'll let you ask the question, but can I just come back to this? I think it, it is premised on, there's a relationship here between what we understand by binding and whether we understand it covers only contentious disputes. And if the clause only covers contentious disputes, then you can understand that the award would be binding on the parties with respect to that dispute. But if the, if the, if the dispute, if it also covers pure interpretation, then the idea that the award is binding on the parties with respect to that dispute kind of doesn't really have any meaning. And so when it says binding or binding on the parties, it could mean that, but then it kind of doesn't, doesn't give you anything. It could mean binding on the treaty parties, but not on investors or investor state tribunals. So in future investor state cases, you couldn't make an argument against that if you were the state, which would then make whatever the interpretation effectively, it'd be a floor, but not a ceiling. The, the investor could ask for something higher, and the investor state tribunal could award something higher, but they couldn't award something lower. Or you could understand binding to be binding in general, binding on the treaty parties, binding with respect to future disputes, binding on investor state tribunals. Now, that is certainly not expressly in the treaty. And so it depends on what you understand binding to mean. But there's a relationship between what we understand binding to mean and whether we think it covers contentious only or investor. So do you want to come on your few questions? Before you before then? No, I just wanted to ask my team, uh, thinking the way that Andrew was thinking earlier in his initial presentation. Why, why do you assume that if the parties can negotiate an agreement in a bilateral treaty that becomes binding on them, that they can't assign the competence to negotiate to a third party, to a tribunal, through the form of interpretation? Why do you see that that doesn't fit under Article 31? Well, I, that's an interesting question. What I, so the first thing I would say, I don't think this it does. So my reading of this bit is that it doesn't give the tribunal the, it's not like the FTC interpretation provision in NAFTA where it says the, the FTC has the authority to come up with an authentic interpretation. It just says they have the right to resolve this dispute about, um, uh, and it comes back, I think, to the point of it, it has the authority to resolve this concrete dispute. So I guess my answer to that with respect to this bit was I don't think it does that. But if it did that, um, yeah, there's nothing that says that parties can't agree to a method to authentically interpret the treaty. So I agree, they could do that. But I, I would insist that they could not do it retroactively for anyone who already made a reliance, made an investment in reliance on the earlier provision. 
parties to terminate treaties. So if the Czech Republic is getting in touch with the other state and they both agree, the investors should be on constant notice that that is a risk that exists in international law. It might not be pleasant, life might suck, but that <laughs> is a general risk that you would assume that. Which, which goes to the issue about legitimate expectations, which is what are your expectations? You have been given certain investment treaty rights, but you also know that it's part of a treaty and the treaty parties have certain powers. Now, now, one thing is when a treaty expressly reserves powers to the state, for example, the NAFTA FTC expressly reserving powers to interpret, or perhaps expressly reserving the power to amend at will or terminate at will with no tail. I think it, the question becomes complicated when it's not expressed, but you're implying it from general international, or you're implying it from the Vienna Convention, because the Vienna Convention says that you can terminate a treaty in accordance with the terms of the treaty, or at any time by agreement of the parties. So that would suggest maybe you can do exactly what the Czech Republic has done. Uh, but the question then starts to come out is, do we apply the same general rules that we've developed in traditional public international law, where we weren't necessarily thinking about treaties that had third party beneficiaries, do we apply the same rules in the investment treaty context? I think this is an open question. So who, who wants to come in on Kabir's question? Anyone on this? Mikhail, do you want to come in on any of this? No, I leave the floor to the others. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, I see another question on the back. Um, I have a question in terms of recognition of forcing context, uh, assuming an accused uh, track system. Uh, especially with multinational companies such as like a show right? Um, so what happens when we have like a recognition and enforcement kind of action 
in another country that's not within the, like those two states that brought the disputes? How are they supposed to deal with uh, two separate uh, arbitration decisions that go in two separate ways? Do have any thoughts on that? I would just raise it maybe answer a question with the question. Um, I think what you're saying is you'd have a state state award, you'd have an investor state award, and the investor state award might be subject to the Air Convention or the New York Convention enforcement regime, but the state state award would be subject only to general you know, public international law. And does that then mean the state state award is much more easily ignored? I, I mean, just I think that's the question, and I suppose to build on that, it it doesn't seem that the state-to-state -state award would require enforcement by another jurisdiction, right? If the state-to-state -state award discusses interpretation of the treaty, there's nothing in that award to enforce in a third jurisdiction. I mean, maybe the question you're asking is whether the, I mean, the, hypothetically, the, the enforcing court who's asked to enforce the investor state award should consider whether the state-to-state -state award, which under your hypothetical contrary, prevents the enforcement of the investor state award or should somehow influence that. And I would say that the, I mean, for an exit case, you have the exit convention that very much limits, I mean, the, I mean, which requires that the award be enforced as if it, the, the investor state award be enforced as if it is a judgment of a court of that state. And I don't think the, under public international law, I don't think that that uh, court has the authority not to not to enforce it. Um, if for a non-exit convention award, you have the New York Convention uh, applicable, and you know, would a subsequent, I mean, could you analogize the state-to-state -state arbitration as set aside in the place of arbitration, and that that's uh, discretionary grounds for refusal to enforce I don't think so. Um, I mean, that's, no. that, you know, but I think, I mean, uh, so I, I don't see them as, I think in the third country, the investor state award wins. That's, so this is. Joe has looked like, so let's go. Well, well um, <laughs> if, if the investor state award is, is, is brought for enforcement after the state to state, um, the investor state award gets enforced um, in, in keeping with the New York Convention. Right. And the presence of the existence of an inconsistent prior judgment, whether it should or should not be a, a New York Convention defense, is not. Um, and you can compare that to um, the way we treat foreign judgments. Most uh, most foreign judgment recognition statutes provide inconsistency with a foreign judgment. A previous one may be a basis for denying. We don't have that in the New York Convention. So I think these are on their they're on their separate tracks. Um, that that would be my my answer. Um, <clears throat> one, I guess two comments. Uh, one, in response to uh, what Michael Reisman said, I wasn't saying that the Iran tribunal arrangement was like a bit. It never occurred to me that it was. What I was saying, and what I continue to say, is that looking at the theme of today's meeting, state-to-state -state investment treaty arbitration, dead end or new frontier. I think it's somewhat in between. I don't think it's dead. I don't think it's a new frontier either. Uh, what I'm saying is that the Iran Tribunal points to certain possibilities that might be productive uh, in this regard, including uh, the points that Andrew was making. We need a system that allows for interpretation, state to state claims, investor claims, we need all of that. The Iran Tribunal did all of that. Second point, um, the <coughs> question was raised of who owns the claims? Is it the government or is it the investor? Um, it's a nice question. I once uh, had a, a NAFTA claim in which it was argued to us that countermeasures could just destroy uh, or at least suspend the investors' claims. That was an interesting argument. I didn't go for it, but I had to write a 43-page dissent because my two colleagues did go for it. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and that was, I thought, too bad. We asked the US government and the Canadian government for their reviews, and they didn't respond. They said nothing at all. Uh, and I found that fairly remarkable because I would have thought it would be important to them. For whatever reason, they didn't respond. So, so can I make two comments in response to this? I, I think the first is that um, I think states on the whole have been very reluctant to come out and say the rights belong purely to the investors and the states can't have reached them in certain ways. And I think there has been a real reluctance to say this. I think there's also been, in the treaty drafting language, a reluctance to declare whose rights they are. Um, that they don't describe them usually as you have a right to this and you have a right to that. The investor, they say there's an obligation not to do something. And so it's kind of studiously ambiguous, I think, substantively often, whether it's a right that belongs to the investor or a right that belongs to the host, home state, or maybe a combination of the two, which is different to human rights law. But on your first point, let me go back to George's point, which is the idea about the relationship between this system and, and um, the Iran-US claims one. I think there, there really is something in your instinct here that one of the things that makes people, I think, feel uncomfortable about the idea that and a state-to-state, three-person tribunal would decide something authoritatively that would then bind future tribunals is a sense that this tribunal looks just like any other investor-state tribunal, just three guys, let's face it, usually guys. <laughs> I won't make any comment on that age. Um, but that it's, just, that it's just three people and why should their opinion be any more authoritative than the Chevron tribunal in the first place? Nine people. So, so exactly. So, so this is part of the difference. So there are differences. There are differences between the two types of tribunals. So there's a difference in that the state-to-state -state tribunal is appointed by the states rather than by the investment states. So that could change, for example, the profile of who's put on it. They're given different mandates. The investor state tribunal is given the mandate to resolve a particular investment dispute, whereas state to state is given an interpretive mandate to interpret and apply the treaty more generally. But one of the things that makes us feel more comfortable with the Iran-US claims tribunal is that the two tribunals look fundamentally different. There's something that looks more authoritative about nine members in the full court of the Iran-US claims tribunal deciding something which then binds subsequent three panel, three member panels that we have in this system. So one of the questions is, if you want state to state to perform this function, to allow for interpretive disputes and make them authoritative going forward, whether it should, it should have a different, different structure. And it shouldn't just be three, it might either be standing or it might be five people or it might be nine, but to give some sense of greater gravitas. Now I'm not sure this is a, a question of, um, privatizing dispute resolution. I think whenever you have a tribunal, there's some sort of privatizing, but it's a question of what you're privatizing it to, I guess. The tribunal, when it had, let's take the issue of nation, dual nationality, big issue. The Iranians were very upset at the notion that an American citizen who was also an Iranian citizen could bring a claim against them. And so they brought an interpretative this uh, question before the full tribunal, and they got back an answer. Dominant and effective nationality is the answer. Okay. Um, however, that's hard to judge. What the three panels did after that, and in all cases, was to consult with each other to try to get a kind of consistent jurisprudence. It wasn't the rules set out any but it was the actual practice, and to this day, it's the actual practice. They consulted to try to make the decisions more or less uniform. But the same thing is true, I would suggest, in exit arbitrations. They don't consult because they don't exist anymore, and they're not bound, true. But everybody, at least not to appear ignorant, reads what's going before. And if it's persuasive, they'll adopt it. And so you get a kind of convergence uh, subject about which I've written in international arbitration, certainly in procedure, for sure, but also in terms of the law. It's beginning to happen. And I think it's going to continue to happen. Nobody wants wildly divergent views. You're not bound, but you sure do look at what others have said. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, so as time goes by, I think that kind of convergence, even in the law, not just procedure, will go on. So I welcome some more questions from the floor. Um, but let me point out, um, I said that there were three cases um, that have come up so far into this. Right? I think there might actually be a fourth. So let me put out the fourth scenario to you, which is that there's the Mexican trucking services case where Mexico under NAFTA brought a state-to-state -state claim under Chapter 19 against the United States for um, the way in which it was not allowing uh, Mexican uh, firms to do trucking within the United States. And as part of that claim, it brought claims not just um, on a state-to-state -state level, but it also said there were violations of Chapter 11 investor rights. And the state-to-state -state tribunal found that there were violations of the investor state rights. And subsequently, and, and recommended that the United States lift the moratorium. Subsequently, the US didn't lift the moratorium, and there was then an investor state case brought against the United States, Kanakar. And they wanted to kind of piggyback off the decision of liability in the state to state case. Now, that case hasn't, um, that's been stored, it, it was launched, but, but hasn't gone forward at the moment. So, one of the possibilities for state to state arbitration is whether or not you could have a state to state claim on certain issues that might be common among a number of investor state claims with then separate investor state claims proving jurisdiction or damages in their particular case. So, so one scenario would be, for example, if there had been a state to state claim between Argentina and the United States to solve the issue of the applicability of the non precluded measures clause and whether or not you could settle that at a state to state level but then have all the individual claims brought by investors. So I want to throw that one out to the panelists and also invite any other questions from the floor. There's one thing I can't let pass, Anthea. Your dismissal of the reasonable award by three guys <laughs> <laughs> at a certain age and your preference for an award by nine Guys and girls, I assume. Come on, come on. Uh, this, the state and the investor scrutinize the universe of potential arbitrators very carefully. They pick people that they think are good. They don't pick people they think are just ordinary guys. Then they agree on who is going to be the chair. And if they don't agree, the matter is reserved to a very, very professional body, whether it's ICSID or the PCA, or if the PCA refers to the IC, ICC. This, this, you are, you just cannot dismiss the quality of the arbitrators who have been selected in this process so casually. I will not say that every award is a paragon of excellence, and I think a lot of awards are wrong. I think a lot of judgments in the Supreme Court are, are wrong. So can I, can I clarify? I'm, I'm not dismissing them. When I say three guys, I actually literally mean gender. Um, but I'm not dismissing that an award by three is not a relevant or a valid award. But I think that there's something qualitatively different that we feel about holding a particular award to be binding on all future investor state tribunals if it was an award by nine as opposed to an award by three. It's, it's going back to George's point. It's not that I discredit any, any particular arbitrators or even a body of three arbitrators. I think there are very, very good arbitrators. But one of the difficulties in suggesting that the state-to-state -state tribunal might bind future investor state tribunals is that the tribunals themselves look pretty much the same. Whereas at the Iran-US um, claims tribunal, the, the one that would bind the subsequent ones look different. And I think there is something in that. Yeah, did you want to come back? Just one point, while I do admit that most arbitrators, at least the ones that prominently appear, are you can't hear you, could be Yeah, most of the arbitrators who we see in at least who are frequently appointed are outstanding individuals and all that. <coughs> I disagree on the point that the motivation that the people, or what the are, lawyers are looking for, for, because I don't think they're looking for for the most noble people. Very often lawyers are looking for, for people who they think would probably best subscribe to their views. So on that point, I disagree a little bit, you know. While they might be of great integrity <coughs> as individuals, we do have a very divergent set of views out there. And lawyers do spend a lot of time trying to find the arbitrator that they think would more in all likelihood subscribe to their school of law. I have to say that um, 
I think you give too much credit to the states. Having worked in New York for 32 years, I am not persuaded by that. If you are thinking of setting up an institution that will make a final judgment, I think that's all you're concerned about. You're not concerned about the quality of the judgment. You're saying, I want someone to say that's the end, and everybody else has to abide by it, regardless of the quality, because you do have no judgments of the Supreme Court, ICJ, and everything that is not necessarily good, but that's the end. I think that's what you're concerned about. But I think what bothers me is that you really give too much credit to think that if the states are making a nomination, if you're setting up an institution like that, who's going to make the nomination? States. And who do you think states are going to nominate? I mean, look at all the appointments that were done with, in the ICC, in the ICJ, in the, in the World Trade, uh, uh, these the bodies. Uh, you, say, you can't say that all of every single one of them are most highly qualified individuals, and they can compete with the three body tribunals that the investor and the state set up. And look, let's be, let's be realistic. They're not, they're, they're going to be uh, previous uh, former diplomats, legal advisors, anyone that the state has an influence with the state to nominate them. So it goes through a political process. And everyone understands that. That's perfectly OK. That's fine. But let's not kid ourselves that they're going to make a better decision than the three-member tribunal, than an investor and the state, for whatever reason, whether they think they're persuaded by their uh, point of view or whether they think they can persuade the tribunal, the third person, they, they put together. So I mean, that's what it is. But all you're asking is that set up an institution that makes the final decision and everybody else abides by it. If that's what your view is, then sure, we can talk about setting up an institution, but let's not talk about quality of the judgments, because I don't think that's what you're going to get. Okay, okay. Who, who else has a question here? I saw a hand up. Okay, was your hand up again? Oh, no. um, yeah, but I'll defer to someone else. So I could, I could come back here to Andrew, particularly in response to Manusha's point. Why was it that you felt that, that this tribunal, that, that this award, if you had got an award from the state to state one, should bind future investor state tribunals? And, and to go back to the point that was made by Lee, did you think about the circumstance in which you got an, award, an adverse award from the state to state tribunal and what, what you do in that circumstance? In the principal motivation, for Ecuador was to obtain clarity with respect to what its obligations are. Now, that clarity could be helpful to Ecuador in the sense that it could conform to what Ecuador had understood to be the inter proper interpretation of the treaty, or it could, as Lee mentioned, could be different. It could, um, but the, the key thing is, is that it would have provided at least some degree of clarity. Now, as, as I mentioned before, one of the problems that Ecuador faced was that it needed to determine what its obligations were. I mean, it needed to make an actual decision. Imagine, you know, you are, you are a responsible figure within your government, um, and you are faced with conflicting arbitration awards that provide conflicting interpretations of whether you need to reorganize your judiciary. This is, a, you know, a fundamental problem. It's a fundamental challenge. Um, and Ecuador's motivation was to obtain clarity as to what it needed to do. It, its first option was to obtain clarity through diplomatic exchanges with the United States. Um, when that failed um, to provide the, the clarity that Ecuador sought, it decided to go to arbitration because that, under the terms of the treaty, appears to be the mechanism by which disputes over interpretation can be um, clarified. And so that's really the, the, the motivation um, the, the crux of what Ecuador was attempting to do. And I'll also make a, a, another point, which I, I think it hasn't been raised yet, but I think is also very important. The, the issue of clarity of obligation doesn't just benefit states, it also benefits investors. Investors need to know what to expect. You have a situation like the one confronted Ecuador, you have two conflicting arbitration awards. One says that an investor should expect that Ecuador's obligations coincide with customary international law. Another word says that it doesn't, that it's something it did in addition um, is required. So from the perspective of an investor as well, um, and investors are left, are left confused. And so it's, it's another important reason why 
there's an important need for, for clarity on these types of obligations. Uh, sorry, so, uh, so Andrea first and then a question from Luke. Uh, I, I just have a quick response to that. I mean, I think it's a, a good point that investors might benefit from clarity. I'm not so convinced that it's the case that Ecuador has an unresolved conflict and that Ecuador could clearly have complied with both awards. It's not, if it complied with the obligation to uh, uh, afford something above and beyond customary international law would by definition be of complying with customary international law. So I don't think that was such a, a perplexing position to be in. It's not as if it couldn't comply with both boards. It could have. No, but, 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 but the issue there is that then you're, you're de facto requiring a state to comply with, with the most onerous set of obligations that are imposed by conflicting. No, I understand that, but there's, you're suggesting that he couldn't comply with both and it needed clarity to understand how to, uh, how to. Well, yeah, no, no, the declarity is, 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 which, it, it, it is which obligation, which interpretation to comply with. Granted, if you comply with the more onerous obligation, you are necessarily also complying with the less onerous one. The question is whether a state should de facto be required to comply with that more onerous obligation. Let me just say, Luke, do you want to ask the last question of today? No, I mean, we're out of time. I can say Okay, well, there will be drinks uh, outside if anybody wants um, and to ask further questions. So if we can. Thank you very much for all the time.